Hello everyone um, and welcome to this webinar. So the title of this webinar is Rendering on Amazon Web Services with Deadline 10. Uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Mike Owen. I'm a Solutions Architect within the Thinkbox team, um, which is now a part of Amazon Web Services. And within that, the Media and Entertainment um, or Visual Effects or VFX for short division that's essentially now formed within the umbrella of media and entertainment within um, within Amazon. So I'd like to spend the next uh, 40, 45 minutes um, showing you deadline, explaining to you Thinkbox and what deadline is if you're new, um, diving very quickly into some of our feature set, um, showing you how uh, you can take advantage of the, the burst compute uh, for cloud rendering um, and how that can really potentially enable your business um, for processing. Um, and also just show you a case study of a project that, uh, that, uh, that, that was finished a little while ago. So a quick overview of uh, Thinkbox and Deadline. So Thinkbox software was actually formed in 2010. However, um, we need to dial that right back for a second and actually go back to the late 90s, 1990s and uh, look at when uh, one of the two co-founders, Chris uh, Bond, created a visual effects company called Frantic Films uh, in a lesser, lesser known place of Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Um, a very um, by nature R&D heavy kind of uh, solution based visual effects studio doing uh, lots of uh, work for loads of famous films. Um, Swordfish, for example, John Travolta, to Superman, Scooby-Doo, lots, lots of films they worked on all the way up to the later ones where they finished up um, with Avatar. Now, between uh, 2010 and, and the orig origins of uh, Frantic Films, uh, they were acquired Prime Focus, the Indian film group. Um, and then around about uh, 2010, James Cameron's Avatar, uh, Chris finished up as the visual effects, one of the, one of the, the, the visual effects supervisors on, on Avatar, reacquired essentially the old R&D team, um, the old developers, the original, um, original development team, um, and the original creators of Deadline, their flagship product, as well as our other products such as Krakatoa XMesh, Frost, and newer ones such as Sequoia. Um, and uh, what happened in March of last year was we were then acquired by Amazon Web Services. But fundamentally, what's interesting is if you go back to the late 90s, pretty much the, 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 the uh, original development team is all still um, together. No one's actually, nothing's really changed. If anything, some of the people that left have actually now come back um, and the old team is 100% is back together. Um, so just talk about uh, Deadline, for example, which is a flagship product. Um, and that's our uh, sort of very broad, very wide uh, compute framework that allows us to um, use large quantities of compute resource and for that to be shared between artists and departments and studios and projects and shows, both uh, across platforms, Windows, Linux, Mac, and also across applications and also across um, a cloud stack such as AWS um, to not just render. I think we need to very quickly get away from that word and think about anything that needs to be offloaded. Anything we have an artist, artist that's particularly could could have the potential to be fun. Uh, twiddling and going to make a second cup of coffee that has the potential to be a candidate to be offloaded to be simulated to be encoded a reoccurring task some of the examples there are fantastic it could actually be to install and deploy software configuration management systems could just be deploy apps or just any kind of data or process movement the idea is because our framework is so broad it can be used both on-premise um, as well as a mixture of just maybe it's all in the cloud um, why have anything on-premise or perhaps the hybrid workflow where you're actually you already have a certain amount of capex a commitment on-premise or multiple on-premises so you could have multiple offices as well as freelance and boutique studio pop-up studios anywhere um, and the idea of being able to use um, the scale and economies of, of, of scale of a public cloud stack like Amazon to deliver the hybrid workflow of burst compute. The idea being it's kind of the best of both Thinkbox and AWS now where uh, we can, you know, potentially infinite, is there such a word, infinitely scale? Um, but the idea is it's, it's at such a scale that really is it's something that can enable you um, from a business perspective. So 
What is rendering for those that are really, really new um, uh, to this particular kind of area of media and entertainment? Um, this is the idea of converting that 3D scene data essentially into 2D pixel um, image data that you end up seeing on the big screen at the cinema or the theater. But because of the levels of compute required, we're talking about distributing each of the frames or perhaps a segment of a frame of an animation to multiple instances or machines. That can potentially, Deadline can help you support, you know, thousands, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of concurrent tasks on as many instances as you want. It's essentially, it's the HPC environment here um, where we're having multiple machines to get the job done quicker. But it's the idea that we can also break apart um, a single frame image. You could be a automotive architectural kind of visualization studio, advertising, marketing, where perhaps you only work on one image, but that one image is, you know, 8K, 16K, it's a huge billboard image. That could still be a candidate for being broken up and being distributed and parallelized across multiple machines and then stitched back together even when it's floating point and it's got lots of different channels and layers um, to allow you to actually uh, deep composite the image, for example. So the hybrid rendering that I, I alluded to a moment ago is that ability to, to, to essentially scale elastically. Um, so what we're doing here is we're talking about uh, the difference between an on-premise being able to then be enabled to have some kind of cloud rendering um, functionality. And so you're then in that hybrid model by using deadline to do the heavy lifting for you. And that's essentially what is the AWS portal which is what I'm going to demonstrate later in this webinar, which is a, a new panel within our major um, interface application called the Monitor, um, which allows you to, to easily scale into AWS. But all this scale and being able to run up all these instances, as fantastic as that may potentially sound to you, it's kind of useless unless you actually have the ability to grab metered or elastic, let's call it, um, licensing for the applications that you wish to uh, also run up on those multiple machines because you won't own or potentially all those extra licenses on the off chance that you might suddenly start up another 500 machines for, uh, for 30 minutes um, one day of the week. And that's where the Thinkbox marketplace really comes in, because what this idea here is that we're actually deeply integrating this um, into a Deadline. It's a transactional available website 24-7. You can put your credit card details in or be monthly invoiced, and it allows you to actually have the metered licensing of applications that we support. Now, because we can't potentially always deliver every single application that there is out there. And we're talking to lots and lots of vendors and all the partners and plugins and ice fees, I'm sure um, everyone is aware of that, that is used in our, in our area for visual effects. Uh, you can also, uh, if it's legally allowed, you can also port forward the IP address and port number of your on-premise floating license servers. So those IP addresses and everything can securely be uh, made available to those burst cloud render nodes as well. So essentially you can push also uh, any existing licensing you have in as well. Um, and so the next stage on from that is wouldn't it be great to make sure you always use up all the licenses you own first before ever spending a, a euro or a cent on additional metered licensing. And there's there's a whole world of features and functionality that we've, we've basically added to Deadline to make that possible. Um, and I think that makes it very, very powerful when it comes to being able to roll your own pipeline. So the ability for us to be so broad, and by that I mean to use one of our four or five API entry points and actually customize plugins and scripts and use industry standards such as Python um, to integrate into your existing pipeline so that when you do have this hybrid model, it doesn't feel like you're using this FTP kind of SaaS based black box solution that is heavily perhaps managed for you, but at the same time, you don't really know what's going on there. Whereas our model is very much, it should feel like a natural extension of your arm as I reach out and when I reach out to this kind of, you know, technically foreign place, but friendly place, which is secure AWS, it still feels like you've got your, your scripts, your pipeline, your plugins, your customized stuff is all still available there. And it's a natural extension of your arm. And so that's kind of the deadline side of the equation. And so we marry that up now um, to, to AWS here, and we can take advantage of the, the obvious things that such a huge public cloud provider like Amazon. Can, can, can deliver. So we're looking at the global scale and that reach, you know, the economies of the scale, the regions, where are they? Low latency, that flexible 
consumption economics, the ability to burst. I'm not going to tell you when I, when I want to use you. I'm just going to come ad hoc and use something called EC2 spot, which is the, the dark cycles of compute time that are heavily discounted, the cheapest compute compute available and use that to, to be elastic in whenever I, I need to burst. But you can also take advantage of all the, the obvious other broad set of cloud services that Amazon is, is constantly uh, announcing new new features and new services for, to the point of which I'd lose track. <laughs> so it's that elastic infrastructure, but the key thing is it's that kind of infinite scale, no more rendering pain, but it's on demand and it's under your it's under your control because all of this that gets created from the deadline perspective gets created inside of your AWS account, not mine, not Thinkboxes, not AWS is one in your account. So you are ultimately in control of this and we're just making it easy for you. So just to speak uh, a moment, um, although I'm sure lots of people are well aware of kind of sort of the scale uh, when it comes to, 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 to Amazon, but to put that into perspective for a second, um, there is an AWS region that is close to one of the major cities or countries that is involved in large quantities of advertising, marketing, visual effects, graphics, generation and rendering and processing in the world. So great examples will be uh, the London region is close to Soho, London, where I'm based. It could be uh, Vancouver. We have Portland is only 10 milliseconds away. Um, uh, it could be LA to San Francisco. It could be uh, our Montreal region, for example. Um, it could be New York to go into North Virginia. It could be anywhere in Germany can go into our Frankfurt region. And the idea is that all of these you can get to low, with low latency. They've got high, high, high volumes of compute capacity available to you. Um, constantly, obviously, announcing new regions as well as you know having 16 already in place. And in each region, remember, that's made up of um, two or more availability zones. And in each availability zone, um, there is at least one or more date actual physical separate building data centers. Um, and so when you add all of that up for redundancy and high availability and just the overall volume that's that's available, that's that's that is a huge. Um, force to be reckoned with. So just to dial back for a second and let's, let's, let's concentrate on, on, on deadline because that's why we're here today. So deadline is very much cross-platform, cross-cloud uh, uh, compute management system and that's, that's, that's really the perfect way to kind of describe it if you ask me. We don't distinguish any difference between physical or virtual and that's kind of handy when it comes to the cloud and virtual machines. Um, we have over uh, 90, I'm not showing all the app kind of icons there because it would just be ridiculous um, but just the the breadth and depth of applications that we support out of the box are probably is one of the most attractive features that we have and that takes a huge amount of commitment from our integration team within Thinkbox to make sure that each scripting language for each of those submitters that goes inside of the different scripting language potentially they're not all Python, Mail script, Mac script, JavaScript, Perl, <laughs> all kinds of scary things, um, uh, the in-app submitters um, uh, to allow you to have deep integration, to be able to submit, take advantage of lots of different features within these applications, to allow us to submit to a single database queue, and potentially if those applications support it, being able to process um, or render or compute or encode or whatever it is you're, you're doing with that application across whichever of the free operating system platforms up there on the top right that we support. And we do path mapping to make sure if one thing doesn't, one computer system on Windows doesn't have a path mapping the same, of course, when it's on Linux and it's slash mount. Um, and same again for Mac, vice versa. We have all our path mapping and drive mapping automation and integration tools that allow us to actually, where possible, pass um, and seamlessly uh, uh, allow data to be um, rendered and processed on a different platform. As long as that application is supported on that platform, then we essentially can exist as well. The Thinkbox Marketplace, as I said, it's, it's pretty kind of critical here that if you want to have um, burst uh, compute, you kind of also need to solve the, the burst uh, uh, licensing problem. So the way in which we tackle this is through something called UBL, which stands for usage-based licensing, which is essentially our metered licensing. This is not a subscription solution. This is a pay-as-you-go on-demand um, licensing system for third-party ISVs, plugins, render engines, and anything you can think of that potentially we use in our industry. It's per minute uh, licensing for both where, where allowed um, on-premise, but also um, for cloud installed software. Um, 
a really nice feature is um, thanks to kind of our acquisition with with AWS is that deadline is actually free now on AWS. Um, you do actually buy and purchase some um, bundles of deadline time, um, but just to allow us to then be able to audit and track and reduce that, we, we then credit that back onto your, your account. Um, but essentially, for intensive purposes, um, deadline is, is, is free when you're running on AWS instances now. Um, so you can purchase in, in hourly bundles. Um, uh, but the the minute licensing is, is is how it's consumed. It doesn't expire. That's a big question I get asked a lot. So between projects or between versions, it doesn't expire. It's it, it's versionless. Okay. So that allows you to use it between projects. It allows you to not worry about ex, you know whether it expires. There's an entire administration portal uh, user account that becomes available to you when you make your first purchase, which allows you to audit, to graph, to export out um, actual usage meter data. There's some lovely features we have actually built into Deadline to do a lot of that for you. But you can also go through your portal and pull all this data down. Um, and this this rendering allows you also to uh, grab those on-demand licenses, but also you can mix and match it using the deadline settings to actually use up whatever rental, permanent, um, subscription kind of whatever is allowed legally, but more importantly, whatever licensing perpetually you own on premise, it allows you to float uh, those licenses through a secure tunnel. Those can be consumed and then dynamically the deadline slave, which is our processing application, can actually then switch when it knows there aren't any more permanent licenses or floating licenses available to then use X amount of metered licensing. So you can really mix and match and kind of sort of optimize it for whatever your particular business is and indeed what, what you own. But the idea is that that flexibility is there. Um, you can use your deadline licenses that are on premise, for example, if you're not using all of them right now today, but you'd like to run up some more um, uh, AWS instances, you can use those deadline licenses that were spare on-prem uh, and use those in the cloud. So really mixing these things up um, to allow you to, to, to really take advantage uh, cost-effectively um, the cloud. So let's just have a look at the kind of the, the architecture for a second and just and just sort of see how what this actually looks like. So on the left we've got on-premise, on the right we have uh, the AWS uh, cloud, let's just, let's just call that um, a region such as Frankfurt. So on the left, we've got traditional, um, the Mongo uh, database, which is the deadline database, um, and a repository, which you can, doesn't have to be on the same machine. You can, it's all modularized, our technology. So that can be sitting on effectively a file share, whether that's Windows or Linux, it, it really doesn't matter. So there's a, there's a file share component there, and we call that the repository, which is just somewhere where we can actually put physical files, like a plugin is a Python file, a script to do something clever in a job, or a monitor is a, is a Python script. So we've got a file-based kind of file share there. Um, and then the Mongo database is obviously then for all the other information that doesn't sit inside of the repository. So X number of render nodes might be on premise. Those render nodes might actually be your workstations that you're submitting the jobs to. You don't even have to have a single uh, render node on premise, for example. You could just be a freelancer working from home and you've got just your workstation, nothing else. Submitting to a database and repository share. And then you'd have uh, the deadline uh, remote connection server or application server there, the RCS. And that's nothing more than essentially a proxy uh, endpoint. The asset file server component, we actually build out and control for you. And that's what's referred to as the AWS asset transfer. And that can run as a service or be demonized and runs on Windows or Linux. Um, and combine that with this portal link, which runs the, the remote connection server for you. You effectively have these two services that can just be running on a, I suggest a machine that's permanently running, not like a, a workstation that could get turned off. And that then builds out and controls the secure SSH tunnel, which is this component that's displayed in the middle here. And we build out this tunnel dynamically for you. Um, and we do all of this as part of what we call building or constructing the deadline infrastructure. So the infrastructure very much is all the components to make cloud rendering work for you. And we do all that IT heavy lifting. You shouldn't need anybody who's kind of IT skilled um, to actually uh, deliver this solution for you. That's, 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 that really is the whole point of what we're trying to build out here. So the SSH secure tunnel to the AWS region of your choice, I suggest always go to the closest one um, is, is a good idea. So let's say, let's say let's go to Frankfurt. And so we build out a endpoint in the 
VPC of your AWS account, um, which will just be like a single small EC2 instance, which acts as our web service endpoint and our effectively our infrastructure point of communication. And it's there that we actually tunnel the communication and it allows us to do a couple of things. It allows us to run an asset server uh, service um, at the AWS side to allow us to then transfer and upload all the textures, cache files, everything you can possibly think of um, to essentially S3. We use the S3 multi-part upload um, behind the scenes, so it's really quite performant. We transfer um, all that data up. We're also going to handle all the path mapping for you. We're also uh, going to then hydrate some block EBS volume storage, which then gets mounted to each of the spot instances that go run up, which you can see here the deadline AWS render nodes. And so when you put what's known as a spot fleet request, and I'll show you this shortly, into um, uh, into uh, the AWS portal inside of the deadline monitor, we're going to start up those compute nodes for you as cheaply as possible. Um, we're going to handle the asset transfer for you, but more importantly, we're going to hydrate the storage, we're going to make it as performant as possible. It gets mounted to those spot instances. And then when the renders actually think, oh, I need to, to render to this output path, which is actually back on my on-premise server, we're going to redirect that for you um, um, and actually then handle that asset transfer back um, from AWS render instances back to your original uh, artist uh, controlled. This is where I want this these files to be rendered to. So the idea is that it really is quite a seamless experience for your artists and you've been able to, to deploy this with minimum effort without any kind of sort of IT uh, specialized kind of uh, expertise. So let's just have a little look at kind of sort of deadline for a second, just to kind of sort of put things back into 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 perspective. I think um, to understand kind of what is this software I'm talking about and how is it how is it going to help you, and also to kind of sort of paint the picture um, a, a little bit more clearly. So the deadline monitor has even when it's it's been you know been been working on premise for so many years and pretty much kind of someone described it to me the other day as as you know it's, it, it's the industry standard of of render farm management like like the foundry's new kids for compositing I was like well that's, that's fantastic to hear people say <laughs> hear someone say that thank you but the idea is that it's 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 a UI feature rich uh, QT based um, application environment um, it can be as intense kind of sort of complicated kind of sort of kind of, kind of sort of like feature rich data view single pane of glass though view into everything that's going on in your pipeline some studios actually refer to to, to deadline and some of our, our, our software as this is our pipeline this this is our studios it's almost this is the heart because the rendering point of a project uh, no matter how big or small your project is tends to be the the the, the 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 common bottleneck and so this kind of sort of forms almost the heart the beating heart of a studio so it, it should be a good experience it should be an easy experience so this this interface can also be made as simple as a single paint pane down the bottom there and just show a pie chart um, it can also be uh, 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 dive right into some deep data, the real-time slave logs that be able to see exactly what every single node is processing and has processed in the past. The the statistical farm status reports, which is this extra dialogue that I've just popped in over the top here, um, actually is not showing real-time information. It's not showing you some of the jobs that are processing like yesterday or last week. It's actually showing data from uh, sort of two years ago, uh, whereas those jobs were long gone. But the information from the statistics point of view, whether it be the overall farm stats, the job statistics, the slave stats, an overview of the entire farm, that information is stored separately. Uh, you could call it a duplicate, but the idea is that this data is not lost when I delete a job, even if it's a failed job or it's a completed job or whatever from two years ago. The idea being that your producers, your project managers, people bidding for new projects would want to ask the question, well, how long did it take to render a project, a shot, a sequence? How much did that actually cost? And so we have tracking in here now for how much licensing, what was the usage-based licensing component I used for this particular project, for this particular series of jobs that would that were submitted by a particular artist, for example, who hasn't worked in the company for two years. Having that kind of data is super important and very rich um, to potentially for you to take advantage of in the future. 
just to call out some of the features in deadline which i kind of get asked about quite a lot which i just think it's kind of nice to just kind of sort of showcase a few things here really just to just to literally dip your toes into kind of the kind of some of our thought process that, that we have at thinkbox so cpu affinity is kind of sort of a very common thing uh, windows users very much know how you right click and um on the taskbar in windows and you can say in the task manager to kind of uncheck one of the cpu affinity uh, check boxes to kind of make that machine uh, sort of come back to life and be a little bit more interactive again when all the other uh, threads on the machine are basically busy rendering or processing and they're all you know to actually kind of sort of allow me to actually go and check my email or something so if you kind of sort of just take that same kind of logical concept for a second and just transpose that to to, to gpu affinity what, what we were asked for here is that uh, multiple gpu cards multiple slots in a in a, in a single physical or, or virtualized it could be machine don't necessarily scale linearly but they do up to a certain point or i'd like to actually process because uh, you can run multiple deadline slots instances on a single uh, physical virtual machine instance you could actually slice up the number of deadline slaves and each deadline slave has a different GPU affinity so say for example to parallelize this example let's have slave 0 and let's have slave 1 so I've got two slaves and in, in each of those slaves I'm going to carve it up so the first slave is GPU slots zero and one because it's zero indexed and then if I've got four GPU cards I'll then have two and three in the other slave allowing me to pick up perhaps two instances of perhaps the same Maya Redshift job for example or Octane or V-Ray Next GPU render or something like that to actually then allow me to carve up dynamically which uh, which which GPU cards are being used by which deadline slave or perhaps you just want to have one deadline slave keep it simple but you want to be able to actually carve up dynamically which GPU cards are being used because it's actually a workstation and that's very much the premise of where GPU affinity kind of sort of came into play here um, was kind of sort of we we're listening to the customers and they're like we need this kind of this way to carve up GPU cards in, in slightly more dynamic different ways so a whole kind of sub product but by no means um, sub in terms of it's not that great um, is draft and deadline draft um, is essentially um, a wrapper it's it's a really nice very convenient um, Python exposed wrapper um, it comes as a module you can actually use it standalone you don't have to execute inside of deadline um, it, the Python module is literally called draft so you can see there I'm just saying import draft in your Python script and as long as you're executing that and you've sys path appended the location of where that draft mod pi module is then you can bring in that module from your deadline repository we do clever things it's cached the Python module down onto the local machine so if you target that it loads and starts and uh, works really really nicely what is it is it a replacement for After Effects or Nuke or Fusion? No, it's it, it's not. But it is a lightweight compositing and video processing tool. It's essentially a wrapper around very common open source projects such as FFM uh, MPEG, um, um, Image Magic. Um, it's compiled from source OpenEXR, um, some uh, some Open Image Library stuff. Um, and if you combine all of those things, just like FFmpeg very powerful tool but also anyone who's actually tried to, to use ffmpeg and you end up finding that you have the world's longest command line arguments in a string uh, to actually just get it to process to create a quick time um, or do a little resize and can you give me a quarter and a half res h264 mov of that image sequence that i just rendered out um, when that job completes on the deadline render farm well that's exactly what draft does so as well as being standalone it also works perfectly really really nicely and automatically inside of the deadline queue it allows you to do things such as create a first a middle and last frame thumbnail upload those to shotgun or talk to my f track or talk to my nim or talk to my own on-premise production management tracking system that i have because it's just python that event plugin we could do some conversion i've already talked about quicktime but some slap comps a over b can you put a, a company logo and uh, a time time code um, in the bottom left hand corner and perhaps also put a, uh, you know a load page at the beginning and perhaps something at the end and we can process both images and video more importantly we can also resize and we can crop things as well and where that becomes really really important is in my next slide which nicely leads me on to jigsaw so Jigsaw kind of actually came um, from uh, a couple of studios, including one of mine that I was working at once when I used to work actually in, in post-production as well. And it's 
that it's the idea of effectively being able to those high resolution images but it could just work for animations per frame as well but it's the idea of instead of uniformly slicing up a image uh, a large frame it could be 4k 8k it could just be a really large image or whatever into uniform x and y um, tiles let's call it what if because we know that say an example of a say you've got a tracking shot where you've got the uh, a car coming driving towards you and so as the car gets bigger in the in the in the frame of the camera um something like the the front of the car the headlights we know that the headlights lots of ray tracing and that's really the area where it's going to take a lot longer to render than elsewhere well let's just let's just take that example of mine there and let's just transpose that to my friend the little rhino here um, and let's just pretend for a second that his horn um, is going to take a lot longer to, to to process than perhaps the rest of his body and the idea here is to have non-uniform um, regions let's call them and in each of these regions we could actually multi uh, resolution up the number of regions or tiles within within that single region so it's essentially tile rendering which is available in lots of other render farm kind of scheduling kind of software out there in the world but it's kind of sort of taken it to the next level and kind of put it on steroids um, so it can be as simple as x and y number of x number of y uniform tiles and regions and it can behave just like sort of the basic system but it can also be this kind of like quite clever you can save this so it actually remembers these this setup and it actually saves this information inside of the scene file we support five applications which are kind of sort of the more kind of the heavyweight kind of applications in the industry from max Meyer, modo rhino from mcneil and uh, side effects houdini we save that data in the scene it allows you to open up a scene file that perhaps was a particular camera that was created by a freelance artist that isn't in your studio because they're not there because they left two weeks ago you can still load up this information reload up the jigsaw interface and resubmit um, a frame uh, with the same regions in place because you might need to re-render a patch because our clients come back with a last minute after the deadline kind of um, change but the idea is that by slicing up these regions perhaps in certain areas at a more granular level then you can actually um, get things processed by paralyzing it across more machines um, quicker and um, of course none of this would be any good unless we had draft that I showed you earlier to be able to stitch these images together so EXR um, the arbitrary channel passes so in OpenEXI would be uh, the multi-layers, multi-channels, um, floating point, 32-bit, 16, whatever. Um, we support all of those things. Um, and these images can then be stitched back together again. So that's kind of a lot about AWS, a lot about Thinkbox, our background, and also you know a brief kind of dip your toes into, into deadline. Um, for those that are kind of up to speed with deadline, you'll know that there is a huge feature set um, already inside a deadline and for those that are new it's there to be uncovered um, to potentially enable your business um, and to help you process things and make it, your lives easier um, and that's kind of the premise very much with the AWS portal which was to try and make things easier um, um, for for artists to be able to to burst compute so we're getting close towards the end of this webinar um, I'm just going to take you through this demo and then show you a case study um, before we then open up for questions. So let's, um, let's, let's, let's dive into this video and I'll, I'll talk you through what's happening um, at each step of the way. So we're gonna essentially have eight simple steps to render on EC2 spot um, using the, the deadline portal. So the first step is we're gonna submit using, uh, we're gonna use Maya and, and, and Redshift as the example here and Redshift's GPU, so that's great. We've got that complexity to deal with. So in Maya, we've got this test scene. It contains 50 frames of camera animation of our golf, gold leaf um, lady um, to render. We're gonna open up the integrated deadline submitter, which will be the same one that's on premise. The limits there for licensing, for metered licensing for Maya and Redshift, they're in place for usage-based licensing. The output path is all set. Uh, Pre-cache the asset files or upload the asset files, that's great. We're gonna set an output path just like we would, and it's an on-premise file path, I should point out, um, so that the uh, AWS portal asset transfer can, can handle the assets. And we're just gonna hit submit, and we're gonna submit that job into the deadline queue. We're now gonna create that infrastructure that I explained earlier on AWS that's gonna allow us to have that endpoint. 
So there is another video. Uh, it's called AWS Portal Setup. It's on our YouTube channel um, that just kind of sort of goes into this into more detail. But what we're going to do is we're going to, in the monitor, there's no job queued. We're going to start up the config infrastructure. We're going to choose a region that I'm close to, such as Portland, Oregon, if I'm on the US West. And you can see instantly it just goes into the actual deadline infrastructure um, and uh, it loads it all up. And in a few minutes, the infrastructure is created. So we're going to launch an actual EC2 spot fleet now of these GPU enabled. So we just click on the, the start spot fleet button there. Once it's created, you can see all the different armies we have available there. We're going to select the, the, the Maya Redshift, um, Maya 2017 Redshift army. So we've got a load of pre-built machine images. Click on the GPU button. So we get a preset, which instances are the ones with GPU in them. We've actually pre-selected the G3, so the graphics third generation. But we're going to add the G2 ones as well for fun. Um, sometimes they can be cheaper. Uh, we can see the price there in the second column, Linux or Windows, depending on what we're running. We're going to set a maximum price in, in, in US dollars that we're willing to pay. And then the target capacity is literally how many machines would we would we like to request? So let's, let's put in 40. And then we're going to hit launch. And, you know, this once that infrastructure is up, this takes literally a minute or two. We'll just fast forward for the purposes of, of me not hanging around here today. You can see it's blue because we've submitted. There's capacity of 40. You can see what instance types we've asked there um, into, into US West 2 Portland, but this could just be for Frankfurt, for example, so EU Central 1. And what we can see here um, is that the instances um, will start up. Um, they'll go from blue, which just means they're brand new unknown to idle. And then we're literally going to wait, you know, for this job to, to, to finish rendering. So after a few minutes, uh, the first tasks will um, become complete. Um, and they'll go from green waiting to start to actual to, to, to rendering. We're going to fast forward it because no one wants to, to watch paint dry. Um, I think the render time is a few minutes per frame. But that's the beauty of why we need, you know, lots of machines. So the whole time we can see um, that uh, the usage base limits uh, 33 and 33 on the left hand side there for Maya Redshift have gone up and gone down. It's just a particular number of machines. It's very dynamic um, that uh, are being used at any one time. Um, so it's 33 rendering because some of the frames have completed, for example. Um, and we can just use a graphical interface like the pie chart just to show it in a much more easier way graphically, for example. As I said, it's a few minutes per frame, so we just speed this up. Um, but what we're really showing here is how the limits are being used. They're dynamic. They're going up and down there. They're on 38 at the moment. We can see some of the frames are completing. We can easily right click and explore the output and look at the frames which are automatically being transferred back by the asset transfer system through the secure SSH tunnel back to my on-premise um, storage, which actually for this example is actually the lap, my, you know, that my documents folder on my laptop because I'm just a freelancer. Um, and so what we can see is that the frames are completing. The last few ones are kind of sort of coming in. All those frames are rendered back to my on-premise. I can just check and I can see that. I can see my limits go down to zero. And then essentially we're done. I've just burst to a public cloud securely. I've got all my frames back. Um, and uh, I don't need this, this on-demand kind of these instances um, anymore. So let's right click, let's stop the spot fleet. This is really nice. So we readjust automatically the deadline performance settings because my render queue suddenly got a lot bigger with 40 plus more machines. My performance is different now compared to what it was when I only had one or two machines. So we dial up and then we dial back down the performance settings. And we just see that the spot fleet is essentially slowly being terminated and shutting down. You can see there it's saying fulfilled. So we could leave the infrastructure up, or if we don't need that anymore, and to save us the you know, uh, uh, five minutes of it starting up, we could leave it, or we could just get rid of it. So let's just right click, and uh, I'm jumping ahead there, but we, we've, um, we've killed it. Um, and this, the, the deadline infrastructure takes, I don't know, it's five or six minutes, and it takes about the same amount of time to kill it, kill it as well. So um, you can just shut that down if you know you're not going to need any more um, burst render capability for that day or perhaps that week. You might, as I said, you might want to keep it up for a little bit longer. So we can kill the infrastructure without killing the spot fleet requests if you want to do one instead of both. So we can see the spot fleet request is, is uh, if there's more than one, which you can do um, for different types of jobs and render multiple things all at the same time. We're going to wait for the spot fleet request. There we go. Boom. Done. 
and then the infrastructure is going to kill itself off. As I said, in total, five or six minutes to do all of that. So it takes a little bit of time, but you know, really it's nothing compared to kind of going in and reading the manual <laughs> um, and trying to work out how to do this stuff yourself. Why don't we look at some of the statistical information? So we just dock the job details panel and in here we can just dive in and expand the section called stats. And we can see there that the, 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 the job rendering time, uh, the running time, sorry, was, was 11 minutes, 16 seconds. But the total task time was about four hours and 24 minutes if we'd just been processing on one machine, yeah? So that's kind of where the speed up of all these machines obviously really helps. And then we'll just use, this is just an internal tool one of my colleagues built ages ago, but essentially we're gonna load up in the image sequence player of your choice and make sure those rendered frames look okay. Um, and just, you know, just ex examine that render output. And essentially that is the AWS portal. It should be eight steps and it should, in theory, it should be that easy. And the idea is it's a real enabler for you and your company. Um, we've got lots of documentation on um, how the AWS portal works. It goes into great detail into all the steps I've just shown today. Um, and I'll give you the, the URL for our doc site in a moment. I just wanna finish off by showing you one of our customers, which is actually two, um, but there's a couple of interesting kind of sort of um, ideas um, from this company. One of which is Barnstorm Visual Effects and, and Theory Studios came together to work on a surprise prize. It's actually an Amazon uh, Prime uh, video TV series, Man in the High Castle, quite popular. Um, but uh, they came together um, as a virtual studio, so they don't actually exist. And they don't have a render farm, essentially, with freelance artists um, spread across the US, and I think they've even got a couple in Europe as well. Um, the scale of the work was, you know, it, they, they freely admit it was their largest project to date. Lots of the shots were, were in 4K, but rendered at 8K, um, some even higher. Lots of multi-gigabyte frame sizes, lots of scary things going on. And they used our deadline with the AWS um, infrastructure and rendering capabilities that I've just shown you. They use the Thinkbox marketplace that I've shown you um, this afternoon to scale to, 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 to several hundreds of instances. Um, they use the Jigsaw, which I showed you earlier, um, to take advantage of that non-uniform tar rendering to really break up some of those large resolution images that I just, I just set up the top there, and then automatically stitch them together. Business benefits, I'm hoping it's kind of really, really obvious now, but the idea is that, you know, it's high quality, low cost by using EC2 spot, which is those dark CPU cycles um, of effectively unused computers that we have in our in our, in our our data centers. Let's take advantage of those. Let's use CPU, GPU, use whatever makes sense for you for whatever kind of thing you're trying to process. Um, it allowed their freelance artists, their virtual studio to come together and deliver some really nice effects. And really, I saw that series, I thought it was, it was really good. Um, uh, and of course, massively scale and have that elasticity because they took advantage of our licensing stuff as well. Um, they tell me their statistics were, you know, a thousand days, they dropped it into four days worth of rendering, which is fantastic from a client perspective. Probably the best thing to do is to make sure that the client doesn't realize that they can actually do that because when a client knows they can do that, you know what's gonna happen next time around. However, they were really, really happy with the with the solution. Um, and so they're quite happy to stand up and kind of the, um, talk publicly about, about how happy they are with us there. And that's just one case study of lots we've, we, we have um, are some of our customers. So that's pretty much it for me. Um, uh, I'm more than welcome to take questions um, um, and try and answer as best as I can. However, I am just one person, um, but more importantly, uh, the whole team behind me um, uh, are available. Um, through one of our various kind of contact points. So our landing page is 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 um, all through sort of the Thinkbox software URL. Uh, so there's deadline. Our documentation is available via docs. Uh, a great place to kind of socialize and chat with us is on our forums. Um, it's also a fantastic place um, from a time zone point of view um, with a lot of our expertise based in kind of sort of North America and stuff like that. And if you really want to get an answer to a question quickly, then I think it's 65 or 70,000 forum threads um, 
on our forum that's been there for a long time and you can answer a lot of queries you might have already on our forum because if you've encountered a problem chances are one you know someone else one of your peers has as well so it's a fantastic place just to kind of hang out and socialize um, for private kind of confidential or otherwise um, tickets for support it's literally support.thinkbox or you can email that support at and I'm told we even have a Twitter account I think maybe in a maybe even a Facebook and LinkedIn <laughs> I don't think I've paid that much attention to those so thanks very much for your time and uh, uh, have a lovely afternoon and uh, good evening goodbye